docile, docile, we have all become tame It's about time that we become hostile, look how our history Hallelujah Well, Mishpachah, this week We are in Exodus 34 And I am going to start us off I'm going to start off by reading verses 1 through 4 And it says And Yahuwah said unto Moshe Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moshe rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as Yahuwah had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. Now, I want to remind you that these first four verses is an extension and continuation of the conversation between Yahuwah and Moshe from the end of chapter 33. Remember, Moshe was asking Yahuwah to shew him his esteem, which is anglicized in the text to say, shew me thy glory. And Yahuwah informed Moshe that no man can see his face and live, but that he would place Moshe in the cleft of the rock and Moshe would see his back parts. Now, here, Yahuwah is instructing Moshe to hew two tables of stone like unto the first tables. And he, Yahuwah, says he will write upon those tables the Debarim, that is Hebrew for words. And these are the words that were in or on the first tables. Now, I mentioned this before, but for those who may not know, Debarim is the true Hebrew name for the book of Deuteronomy. And for those who may be taking notes, as it pertains to the Torah, the Hebrew name for the first five books can always be found in the first sentence of each book. So, for instance, Genesis is Bereshit, meaning in the beginning. Exodus is Shemot, meaning names. Leviticus is Waikra, meaning he, Yahuwah, called. Numbers is Bamidbar, and it means in the wilderness. And then, of course, again, Deuteronomy is Debarim, which means words comes from the word debar. It is also the Hebrew name for the Ten Commandments, or more appropriately, the Ten Words. And these are the words that will be inscribed on the two tables so that they are like unto the first tables, which Moshe break. All right. Now, the original tables, they were written on and given to Moshe by Yahuwah. Let's look at Exodus 24, 12, it says, And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. Now, in the last lesson, we talked a little bit about the spiritual and the physical. And the Bible teaches us that Yahuwah is spirit. It also tells us that Yahuwah is Kodesh. More importantly, he is most Kodesh. And I want to explain a concept that I learned very early on in my awakening. If you can receive it, it will aid you in your understanding of why certain things happen in the Bible. Real quick, let's look at John 20, verses 16 to 17. And it says, Yahusha saith unto her, Miriam, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, 
which is to say master. And Yahush, Yahusha saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my Elohim and your Elohim. Now, here, Yahusha appears to Mary Magdalene in his esteemed or his Kodesh state. And he has instructed her to touch me not. Now, why do you think Yahusha tells her this? The reason is Kodeshness and abominations are both extremely contagious, meaning that they can be transmitted. Not only can they be transmitted, but if certain unfavorable conditions are present at the time of transmission, it can also cause death. Just keep that in your mind for a second. Now, further down in this chapter, we get to verses 26 and 27, and it says, And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Yahusha, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Shalom. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Here, Yahusha is instructing Thomas to actually touch him in his Kodesh state by sticking his finger into his side. But a certain condition must first be met. Now, in this statement here, <clears throat> when you have a semicolon in a sentence, the statement following the semicolon is additional information that's used to clarify or give further instruction to the information that preceded the semicolon. Therefore, the condition that Thomas must first meet is that he must be faithful and believing. In other words, obedient and trusting. Now, what do you think would have happened to Thomas if he did not first meet these conditions? And Thomas answered and said unto him, My master and my Elohim, Yahusha saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The last portion of this verse is foundational. It is a cornerstone of our obedience and following the way. It shows that for you and I, a level above and beyond what Thomas had is needed for us. And allow me to quote you a passage to pair with this, to pair with what I just told you. And that passage is, for I say unto you, that except your righteousness, that is to say obedience, shall exceed that of the scribes or the writers of the books, and the Pharisees, who are the lawgivers, or the ones in whom the Torah was entrusted, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of Shamayim. Let's look at Exodus 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now Moshe kept the flock of Yithro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. And the messenger of Yahuwah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moshe said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Now, what just happened in these verses? More specifically, verse 3, belief. Moshe did not say, 
this cannot be. This is not happening. Or am I tripping? No. He said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when Yahuwah saw that he turned aside to see, Elohim called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is Kodesh ground. Why does Yahuwah instruct Moshe to put off thy shoes from off thy feet? What would have happened to Moshe's shoes if they had come into contact with Kodesh ground? Would they have been burnt up or destroyed? It is possible. If certain conditions were not met and Yahuwah willed it, it is also possible that Moshe would have transmitted that Kodesh to everywhere he stepped with those shoes had he not removed them. This could have led to death and destruction on a grand scale. I believe that the real reason that Yah instructs Moshe to remove his shoes is, for one, to prevent what I have previously mentioned, but also to transmit something directly to Moshe because of his belief. Let's hop back over to Exodus 24 for a second. It has long been suggested and understood that the original tables of stone given to Moshe by Yah were constructed of either sapphire stone, or if you believe those who practice Talmudism, lapis lazuli. But I can tell you that as it pertains to lapis lazuli, that is highly unlikely because the nearest vein or seam of lapis lazuli in relation to where Yasharel is currently at, Mount Sinai, at this point, the nearest vein or seam is in northern Afghanistan. Now, lapis stone is not found in mines in or around Egypt at all. When I covered Exodus 24 a while back, I showed how it is plausible and very likely that the original tables were hewn by Yahuwah out of the paved work that we see in verse 10, in which it tells us that this paved work is the body of Shamayim. To further clarify this point, the word for tables in Hebrew is luah, and it means to glisten you know, like a sapphire. And Hebraically, luah means the instruction that secures the set apart. But again, Moshe, he break those tables by tossing them toward Yasharel at the base of Mount Sinai. So what are we to make of these renewed tables that we see in Exodus 34. Is their composition the same as the first? Well, in verse one, we can see that the instruction is for Moshe to hew these two tables himself. Whether or not he had access to the same quarry that Yahuwah used is hard to say. I'm leaning towards, no, he did not. Also, we will see later on in this chapter that this time around, Moshe is going to be the one who will inscribe these words on the tables. But this is why I went over with you the stipulations and conditions of Kodeshness. In verse four, 
Moshe has risen up in the morning and traveled up to Mount Sinai with the two tables of stone. These tables will undoubtedly be exposed to Yahuwah and his Kodeshness, which for one, if conditions of the stones are in order, cause these tables of stone to become sanctified and subsequently set apart or Kodesh. You should note that these tables of stone will be placed inside of another Kodesh structure, the Ark of Testimony. And we all know what happened to Uzzah when King Dawid set forth to move the Ark. Commandments must be obeyed. Conditions must be met. Kodeshness is not something that should be taken lightly. One final thing to note from the first four verses. If you remember Moshe's initial ascent up Mount Sinai, Yahuwah allowed Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders to accompany Moshe partially up the mount. This time around, no man shall come up the mount or even be seen on the mount. Think about all that transpired the first time around and who all was involved. I guess it's safe to say that at this point, only Moshe checks all the boxes to be able to be in the presence of Yahuwah and his Kodeshness. Let's read verses 5 through 7. And Yahuwah descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of Yahuwah. And Yahuwah passed before him and proclaimed Yahuwah, Yahuwah Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. When I first looked at this set of verses, I asked myself, what is the significance or difference of Yahuwah proclaiming his name here and what occurred with Moshe back in Exodus 3. Exodus 3.13, it says, Moshe said unto Yahuwah, Behold, when I come unto the children of Yasharel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? In Exodus 3, Moshe is exclaiming to Yahuwah that you want me to tell the children of Yasharel that the El of your fathers has sent me unto you. They will say, what is his name? And what shall I say unto them? I was reminded that El is a general title. It is a general title that was used throughout antiquity in various different cultures, from the Sumerians, to the Canaanites. It is no different than people using G-O-D today. It is not a name. Therefore, that title in and of itself holds no kabod, weight, or esteem. Remember, I mentioned before that the children of Yasharel at this time had lost the understanding of who Yahuwah was. They knew the stories of creation, of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but the understanding of how it applies to their lives was gone. Yahuwah responds to Moshe to tell them that I am have sent me. And this is to say, I exist, or I am the existing one. I will be what I will be. And again, this is much like us. 
Many cultures today believe in L, but which one? What is the name of the L you serve? All Yasharel knew is that their ancestors called him El Shaddai, the L of the mountain. And there were no mountains in Egypt. Yahuwah goes on to tell Moshe, thus shall you say unto the children of Yasharel, Yahuwah, Elohim of your fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov hath sent me. It is at this point in Exodus 3 that Moshe and soon the children of Yasharel now have a name that they can attach to their L. Yahuwah. And they and Egypt witnessed that there is power attached to this name. And this Elohim, as Yahuwah states in Exodus 3.20, and I will stretch out my hand and smite Mitzrayim with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. The proclamation of Yahuwah's name in Exodus 34 is a bit different. Remember, in the last chapter, Moshe's request was that Yahuwah show him his way, and also for Yahuwah to show him his kabod, his weight, or esteem, or in English, glory. And Yahuwah basically responds to Moshe that when that time comes, that he will place him in the cleft of the rock, cover him with his hand, and Moshe will see his back parts. And when we looked at this event in the previous lesson, we were able to see behind the wording and discover that this was a pointing to Messiah. So now in Exodus verses 5 through 7, we are seeing the application of what Yahuwah told Moshe. The English word proclamation, it appears for the first time in the Bible here. And what this tells me is that there is a difference between the saying or the utterance of Yahuwah's name that Moshe is instructed in Exodus 3 and the proclamation of the name of Yahuwah that we see here. Here, as Yahuwah passes by Moshe, he proclaims Yahuwah, Yahuwah Elohim, and this is followed by several characteristics that are associated with his name. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Now, this proclamation is done as the response to Moshe's request to not only know Yahuwah, but also to see or understand his esteem. I want you to take that in for a moment. Because these characteristics, this is who Yahuwah is. And to know him, as Moshe requested, is to first understand who he is. This is also tied to the esteem of Yahuwah that Moshe additionally requested. And remember, when Yahuwah informed Moshe of what he would do to honor this request in chapter 33, we saw a pointing to Messiah at that point, meaning that the esteem of Yahuwah and all of these characteristics can be seen in the purpose and life of Messiah as well. John 14, 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be esteemed in the Son. And 20. And that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, 
and ye in me, and I in you. This is perfection. If Yahushua is in the Father, and we are in him, and he dwells within us, then we should know him. And if we know him, then these characteristics of his esteem should be characteristics that are present and can be seen in us as well. Let's look at Matthew 5, 48. It says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in Shamayim, is perfect. Yahuwah concludes, or he continues and concludes in verse 7, which we have discussed in a previous lesson that he keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving the penalty and the rebellion and the sin or sinner. The Hebrew word for sin here is hata, and it means an offense but concretely it means an offender or sinner. And that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the penalty of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. The third and fourth generation here means descendant or grandchild or great-grandchild to the third or fourth degree or generation. On the surface, this is definitely applicable to the generations mentioned, but it also means that the penalty that is due to the fathers will be visited upon his seed. It is perpetual. Let's look at Romans. 3, 23 to 24, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the esteem of Elohim, being justified freely by his esteem through the redemption that is in Mashiach Yahusha. It is the esteem that we are looking at, correct? So some may see this and believe that it says here that justification and favor is freely available to all. And I'll have you note that freely here means without charge or without cause, but it also is used to imply for naught or in vain. Justification of his favor is afforded only through the redemption or the redemption process that is in Yahushua HaMashiach, our kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer redeems those that are his kin. And to be considered as kin means that you are identifiable by the characteristics that he possesses. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and in truth, keeping the commandments. The verse we read in Matthew about being perfect, it does not mean perfection as the Western mind would think. It means to be complete. To be complete does not mean that one has not had missteps, as there are provisions for those occasions that we find throughout Torah and in Yahushua. Let's look at 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, Yahuwah is not slack concerning his promise or covenant, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's continue on in Exodus with verses eight through 10. And Moshe made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. 
And he said, if now I have found favor in thy sight, O master, let my master, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people and pardon our iniquity or penalty and our sin or trespass and take us for thine inheritance. We get a sense of the weight or kabod of the esteem that Moshe has just received and witnessed as he makes haste and falls prostrate, worshiping before Yahuwah. And the word worshiped here, it is shaka, and it means to depress, to crouch, to fall prostrate to, or to pay homage to, as in royalty. And he goes on <clears throat> to again show us that he has a full understanding of what Yahuwah meant when he instructed them to put off thy ornaments by asking Yahuwah to pardon their penalty and their offense or sin and to go amongst them. And Yahuwah responds by saying that he will make a covenant. And this covenant will be made with all thy people. This is important to note. As we read through these accounts, it may appear on the surface that these statements are being directed solely at our ancestors who are present at this time. This is true, but does not encompass the scope and full understanding of how a covenant promise is applied. When a covenant is made, it is made not only with the people present at the time, but also with those that are in the loins of the males who are present. Thus here, as we see all thy people, you should know that this includes you and I. Now, Yahuwah says that he will do marvels before us, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. The word for marvels here is pala. All right. And it means to distinguish or separate. This means that these marvels Yahuwah will do are specific to us. They will be distinguishable or identifiable in us only. Entry number two in the definition for Pala says it's to be great or wonderful, but also difficult. And entry number three, which says this is causatively, it is to make great, difficult, and wonderful. And causatively means that the force or agent causing the action. In this case, Yahuwah will make these things great, wonderful, and difficult amongst us. He goes on to say that all the people among which we are all shall see his work, for it is a terrible thing that we, he will do unto us. Now, terrible here is yare or yara, and it carries a dual application as did pala. Yare means to fear, but it also means to revere, to frighten. So together, these terrible marvels that Yahuwah will do with us is a thing to fear, but also to revere. And we, as his people, are identifiable and distinguished, set apart from all other nations on earth by these things. Now, verses 11 through 27 Yahuwah reiterates many instructions that we have seen and we have covered throughout the Exodus account. Things that we are to do when we come into the land, a reminder of the Shabbats, reminder that thrice or three times in the year, all men shall appear before him at the feast. 
instructions for the blood of his sacrifices and first fruits as well, and etc. And in verse 27, we get a confirmation of who was going to be doing the inscribing on these two tables that Moshe was instructed to hew. As it, as it says, oops, there we go. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Yasharel. Let's pick up in verse 28. And he was there with Yahuwah 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Debarim, or the Ten Commandments. Now, the text here, it is informing us that Moshe was with Yahuwah on the mount and that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It also reiterates that Moshe wrote upon the tables the Debarim, or words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, the longest documented time a person has survived that I could find on water alone was 74 days and 74 nights. The longest period a person can survive with neither food nor water that I could find is not known, as it is highly dependent on several factors, health, weight, climate, etc. In Moshe's case, which is given as a lesson for us as well, none of these things matter, as he is in the presence of Yah, the craftsman of not only the body, but the source of life itself. Later on, Yahushua demonstrates that a 40-day and 40-night fast is doable as well as he afflicted himself in the same manner in the wilderness following his immersion. Not an encouragement for you to attempt a 40-day fast, as I have never accomplished this myself, just stating the fact that we have examples of this being accomplished, contrary to what the world may tell us. But why does the text here say 40 days and 40 nights? It's a simple answer, really, is 2 Corinthians 6.14 tells us what communion hath light with darkness. And in Genesis 1.4, Elohim divided or separated the light from the darkness. And in verse 5, he called the light day and the darkness he called night. I'm mentioning this here as a side note as the deception surrounding what constituted constitutes a day, you know, in Yasharel is, is a heavy topic. And it is something that causes many in Yasharel to stumble. Thus, it must be reinforced. Because Yahuwah separated light from darkness in the beginning of creation, before any man was created who could corrupt this understanding, means that it is foundational to our existence and thus cannot or should not be changed or distorted. Thus it is impossible for a day and night to be reckoned together in the same time periods. There is no such thing as 24 hours in a day. It is foundationally impossible. This is a lesson in and of itself, and I do not plan to teach it here, but I do want to give you some things to place in your mind. The word today, by default and definition, cannot include any period of darkness or night. The word yesterday, by default and definition, cannot include any period of darkness or night. Morrow or tomorrow, which is makarof in Hebrew, and is used to imply the next day, by default and definition, cannot include 
any period of darkness or night. So just know that if one was to ask me how long I'm going to be in the place that we are celebrating the upcoming feast, I will be there for approximately eight days and eight nights. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. Important part, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Exodus 34, 29 through 35. And it came to pass when Moshe came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moshe's hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moshe wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aharon and all the children of Yasharel saw Moshe, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moshe called unto them, and Aharon and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him. And Moshe talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Yasharel came nigh. And he gave them in commandment, or words, all that Yahuwah had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. But till Moshe had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moshe went in before Yahuwah to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Yasharel that which he was commanded. And the children of Yasharel saw the face of Moshe and the skin of Moshe's face shone. And Moshe put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. I begin this study talking about the spiritual and the physical and the reactions and consequences of being in the presence of true Kodeshness. Previously in the lesson, Shew Me Thy Glory, I mentioned that there are some people that when they are awakened to the truth and begin living their lives for the Most High, a change occurs in them spiritually. And this change can sometimes be noticed by others on their countenance, physically. They have a certain glow and shalom about them. We've all heard it of some women being pregnant described this way as well, having a certain glow about them during their pregnancy period. Moshe descends the mount here with the two tables that he has inscribed with the words. He is showing the physical effects of being exposed to a most Kodesh spiritual encounter, being on the mount in the presence of Yah. Moshe is initially unaware of his current countenance, but we can assume that he becomes informed of what is transpiring, as later on in this account, he must cover his face with a veil in the presence of the people due to this effect. This account is interesting to me because it validates several statements made throughout the Bible. Yahusha tells us that no man has seen the Father save he the son. And Yahuwah tells Moshe in the previous chapter that no man can see his face and live. Since Moshe is still alive, at this point, this tells us that Moshe at no time has ever seen the face of Yah. He has been, as in, he has been in his presence, and we can see the after effect of that here. Yahuwah is so Kodesh that even being in his presence under the right circumstances and being deemed qualified and then the right standing to endure this ordeal causes a visible physical effect on Moshe. Do you think Aharon or the elders could have survived this ordeal? 
I think not. We can see from their actions with the molten calf that if they had been called to the top of the mount as Moshe was, this would have been certain death for them. Remember the message from Yehuda about being called and chosen. Those that are chosen are those that are tried. In Revelation 17, 14, we see that those that are faithful, which you must be tried to be deemed faithful, are those that are with the Lamb in his presence. The faithlessness of Aharon, the elders, and Yasharel as a whole with the molten calf has deemed them not suitable for Yah to be in their presence. This is both a consequence of their action and also a blessing as it shows Yah's faithfulness to Abraham and the covenant he made with him and his seed. But even though Yahuwah said that his presence will not go or reside amongst the children of Yasharel, he did, in verse 10 of this chapter, make a covenant with Yasharel. And immediately after making this covenant, he reminded them to observe that which he commanded them this day. And we know our people, for they are a stiff-necked people. If they are not constantly reminded, they are prone to quickly fall back into their adulterous ways. Yahuwah knows this, so he gives them a sign, Moshe, and the skin of his face shining is that sign. It is the visible reminder to Yasharel of the esteem of Yahuwah. In verse 30, it tells us that they were afraid to come nigh unto Moshe. Again, that word for afraid is yare, which means to fear, but it also means to revere. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Side note, do you think that all of Yasharel noticed Moshe's current countenance, his face shining? I believe so at this point. But again, what did Yahusha tell Thomas in John 20, 29? Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. Yehuda Iscariot also saw the esteem of Yahuwah. I guess for some, either the esteem of Yahuwah is not enough to make them believe, or maybe at one point they had eyes that could see, but then maybe that sight became dim or taken away. As we get further into Torah, even the esteem of Yahuwah dwelling amongst Yasharel, for some reason, will not be enough to keep them from being disobedient. Last reading, Galatians 6, 1 through 8. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual or rockle, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Mashiach. For if a man think of himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto them, unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. Elohim is not mocked. 
For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh, or shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the ruah shall of the ruah reap life everlasting. Over time we become so docile, we have all become tame It's about time that we become hostile, look how our histories change We thought that we could win, but we weren't even